little bit. Come to that database table tasks, which is our object for tasks table, inherits from ktable table abstract. The name of the table is, well actually we also added a view table. Um, I'll explain that in a bit, but I'll focus on the behaviors first. So we're gonna set some behaviors for this table here. And the behaviors for this table are lockable, creatable, modifiable, sluggable, and orderable. They all have been predefined for you. This is the reusability aspect of the code in action. You can define your own behaviors. How do you contribute? Create one, put it on GitHub, and make sure that everybody can use it. How, how much time does it take? 30 minutes. And then you can go to the Bahamas and join me for a cocktail. Which would be great. Um, the other thing that we do is we have defined filters on our on our table on our table fields. One filter that we have defined is an HTML filter for our description and a slug filter for our slug field. Why is that important? But because by default the filtering of the framework will filter to a string. And if you want to get HTML in, then a string will basically make all the HTML go. So you need to tell it specifically to filter that field to HTML. There are two ways to do that. You could do that through code. And you can actually do that through where is it? Structure. Description. You see, that's not very clear, but you see here, it says filter HTML uh, colon tidy. You can define that through the comment in your database schema. So if you go back, I'll show it here. Um, in the browse, it actually shows, I'll, I'll zoom in enough. It actually shows the comment, which we call an annotation on the database table field. Right? If you work with Java or work with Java before, you know how annotations work. This is similar. There's a limitation to it because a comment can only be a fixed length, so you cannot put too much in it, but this works. This is the way that you tell this, this field to be filtered as HTML, and if the tidy filter is available, it will also filter it as tidy. Okay, so we done that. We go back. So we have lockable, creatable, modifiable, and sluggable. And then let's see. Correct. Yes, I wanted to demonstrate that you can do it through the APIs and you can do it through the database schema. It's very important when writing stuff for Nuku, again, that you buy yourself a good book about how SQL works. Get your database schemas right. Because I see a lot of people that don't necessarily know what they're doing with database schemas. And trust me, three years ago, I have no clue either. But a book does miracles. Database schemas need to be right. If, you just, if, if your primary keys, your unique keys, your indexes are not right, it won't work. Um, so let's edit this one. There's a typo in here. So OK, let's edit that, save it. And then you will see that it has been modified by administrator. So this is the modifiable behavior in action. There is a little bit of an error or a bug with the, the time. Need to fix that. Um, but in here, I've been, I've been playing with it yesterday. I thought I fixed it, but it's not fixed. So you see here, the modified on date and the modified by information has been filled in by the user that modified it and the date that it was modified. The same thing for locking. If I go here, I'm locking this, so if I refresh it, then you will see that, and I'll zoom in here, that the locked on and locked by information has also been filled in. So now this row has been specifically locked. You know the problem in Joomla with the unlocking of rows, right? That your user calls you and goes like, yo, dude, I cannot edit my article anymore. It's locked. And then you go, well, you need to click the, what's it called? The, the global check-in. And then the user goes, yeah, I cannot find the global check-in. And you go, dope, he needs to be a super administrator or an administrator to do that. And then you need to like, oh, where is that login for that website to go and fix that? You don't need to do that anymore. Um, these things unlock themselves after the session of that user has been expired, right? So the user is out, you, right? I know, I know, I know. I don't want to make those calls. <laughs> and 
and plus you can modify that behavior by specializing the, the lockable behavior to do something yourself. Um, it also does, uh, uh, maybe well, I could try to show it. Um, bah, I'll leave that. Um, if you do two browsers, uh, we cannot show it in one, but if you do two browsers and you try to access it from a second browser, it will show it as locked. You can still click it. You can still click it and you can still see the item, but you cannot save it. It will simply say you it's locked, you cannot save it. Which is handy if you want to see what your customer is doing while he's doing it without being able to edit it. And then when he goes out, you can take over the lock and you can edit it. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so that's something that we have. Um, let's show you the creatable. If I create a new one, let's do a new one. Test, test. Then we save that. Oops. That's not good. Uh, maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Why would you do that? Hmm, interesting. Duplicate entry for key two. Yeah, the slug is regenerated again. Um, Johan, or something like that. Okay. Nope. Is that the bug in the sluggable? No? Ah, mm. oh, yeah, you're right. The slug here is empty. Thanks, Dave. That should do it, right? That should do it. Well, <laughs> so again, shit happens, um, but it demonstrates that the database schema is smart. Why? Because the database schema knows that, uh, and um, Dave is already uh, very fluent in Nuka framework, he knows that there are two unique columns here, the task ID, which is a, an auto increment, and the slug is also unique. The slug is made unique, why? No, oh, two, and what else? CEO, Seth. What are we solving? Seth, do you need Seth components? No. <laughs> anyway, um, so the slug is unique and we couldn't create one because we already had one. That was a mistake that I made by creating it manually. Um, okay, so I was going to show you the um, creatable. So you see that this is one that we created with the creatable behavior on, so it now has the created information here. Um, now, the next thing that I want to do is I want to do enable and disable um, on my field. So I'm going to add some toolbar actions to be able to enable and disable. Typical, right? Um, so what we do here is we, we get our view, and from our view we get our uh, toolbar. We do get toolbar, we add a divider, enable, disable, another divider, and then for the fun of it, we will also add an export to CSV. That gives us something like this. So, we take a task and we disable it. There we go. But we take a task and we enable it. There we go. It does all that for you. And how many lines of code? Actually, there's no magic in here that does that. It's simply saying, take the enabled field and change it from one to zero and back. Um, this is also not a separate action. A lot of people build controllers and they call this separate actions in their controller. There is not something like action enable or action disable. And a good advice, please don't do that. Because you're making your whole architecture a lot less restful. Enabling and disabling is nothing more than changing the value of the enabled field from 0 to 1 or vice versa. It's not an action. The action is edit or post from an HTTP perspective. All right? What does that solve? What does Brad solve? What does browse, read, edit, add, delete solve? It was already set. It solves ACL. And how does it extra solve ACL? We only have five actions to put ACLs on. All right? We don't need anything else. No get states or modified states or manage or any of that. You can br browse, read, edit, add, delete a resource. 
And if that resource is a configuration resource, then that could mean manage, but it's still only edit on the configuration resource. It's, it's a switch you need to make in dealing with architecture. You need to start thinking in resources. Because that's where you're going to expose and your user interface is just a nice add-on for your users to work with. Like I showed you, we don't really need one. Okay, so now this is all fun. Um, let's do some export. Um, so we have this and I want to export it as CSV. Let's hope that all works still. No, it doesn't. Uh, no, it just it should export everything, but that is not the case. No, that doesn't work anymore. Guys, can you fix that? Export is not working. <laughs> well, he bug fixes while we work, and then he does the last part where it should work. Uh, but normally, the export should actually give you a CSV file. Uh, for some reason, it's not, not working. So I'll just continue. What else do we have? <laughs> yeah, that, that's how we work. <laughs> so, okay. Um, one thing I'm going to add to finish off the component um, is I'm going to add a, sp a specialized dispatcher because right now, when I go to my component, it's, well, I already added it, so I'll take this out. Right now, when I go to my component, it's going to re redirect me to view is tadas because it takes the name of the component and then makes that plural, right? We don't want that. It needs to go directly to tasks because that's where we want to direct it. Um, so what we do is we put in a dispatcher, and that dispatcher has the controller set to tasks here. And then it will redirect us to the right view. Again, why is this important? Because we need to get to a resource, and a resource is rendered through the view from MVC, which is view tasks in this case. The, the com tada and then nothing should do nothing, because it's not a resource. You can only call it a web page. Okay? Okay. Now, um, now I have that, that, and that. That's in. Ah, yes. Now let's let's add some stuff. Um, so we already added that. It's already in, but I'll take it out. So what we did, it was already there. Um, it was already there, but I'll take it out and then show it to you. We also want to add quick links so that you can go to a dashboard to tasks, and if you have different views, different resources in your component, you will be able to go to those. Uh, we do that with, with the tabs or with the quick links. Um, that's done by adding those here and then telling uh, your view that it has a dashboard and a tasks view that it on top needs to render. So what we do here is this, then we get this, we get a tasks, um, and a dashboard. If we click the dashboard, then we get nothing. But our dashboard says save, apply, cancel. Because our dashboard, by default, this is going to a resource, and the resource is dashboard. And a resource, by default, you can save, apply, and cancel if there is something behind it. Now, a dashboard, and this is a specific case, is not a resource. You cannot edit a dashboard, you cannot save it, you cannot cancel it. It is actually just a web page, which shows you multiple collections of other resources. Still following? Okay. So we need to tell this dashboard that it needs to behave a little bit different than the default. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a dashboard view. View new folder dashboard. In that dashboard view, we're going to put and then we're going to do something like this. Um, well, I take, well, I'll leave that in. No, I'll take it out because it's not going to work. Um, like that. What is important here is that we are extending this dashboard from Comtada view HTML, and then we're going to reset the dashboard's toolbar. So then we get something like that. Oops. And that's not going. Uh -huh. No, that's not be the problem. Hmm. That's strange. 
Hmm, I'll just continue. Hey, hey. And I'll figure it out in a bit. Mm, folder or template. Okay. What I'm going to do with uh, the dashboard is I'm going to show you how you can use the dashboard to show uh, activities in your component. So the next step, we now build a component with a form and a list, right? We can edit and we can input. We can do that through REST and we can do that through the user interface. The next step is adding other components to work uh, with that part. One of the things we want to do is showing um, logs. You want to log when something happens and then you want to be able to show that, that a user edited an item. So that's what we're going to do. Um, the first thing, well, I'll put it in. So the logs, and then I need to, and there we go, I need this one. Controllers, dashboard controller, and task controller. Now, step one. The controller, I'm sorry, the dashboard is not a resource. So we need to tell the dashboard not to act like a resource. We need to tell to act it like a page, a normal web page. So how do we do that? We create a specific controller for this dashboard, and we tell this controller to extend com default controller page instead of the default. By default, it always goes to resources because that's what you need to do most. Um, if you do com, com default controller, page is going to act like a page. Uh, and then you're going to get something like this, and then it should be gone. Yes. And then it's saying that, well, he's not finding the list template. Um, and that's because I already added it here. I'm going to take this out and take... No, it's not finding the list template. I'll take that code out for a moment. And then... There we go. As you can see, he's already showing recent activities um, because there's already logging information there. So, and then the last thing we need to do here, we now need to tell because we're going to create logs. And we're going to log what is happening. And who knows what is happening? The controller. He deals with the actions. Okay? So we're going to tell this controller to behave as loggable. So we do admin com logs controller behavior, behavior loggable. Now, follow here. We already created a loggable component. I don't have the time to show you all that, but it's there. This is the reusable part of the framework. There is a loggable component there that you can just plug in with one line of code. This is that line of code. If people tweet, I added something with one line of code, then this is what it probably looks like. So we're adding a behavior and we're telling our service layer to fetch this loggable behavior. Where does that loggable behavior live? It lives in comlogs controller behaviors loggable. This is that behavior. Okay? Now, we have added that. And now I need to backtrace all my steps. Yes, we have added this to the dashboard. Okay, I'm going to leave that out. I'll do that in a bit. So what we get here is there was already probably loggable information in there, so I'll clean the logs just to make sure this can go out. There we are. Now, we're rendering recent activities on our dashboard. First of all, we're telling our controller to be loggable. It's going to log. Then we need to render that logging information on our dashboard. So what we do is we take our dashboard, uh, sorry, we take our dashboard here, and we do this. We're telling it to take, and this is where it really gets fun, to take the template, to take a template out of another component, a template built by a designer. That template is called admin com logs view logs widget. It's the widget view of the logs component. We're pushing some information into that template state and the actual logs, which are being fetched through admin com logs model logs. And we see, not going to explain all of it, but getting all the logs. 
And which locks are we getting? Well, we're getting 20. We don't want more than 20. We're getting them from the package TADA, from the TADA component, for the task controller. Only those. We don't want anything else. And then give me the list. Right? So, yes? Can I ask you a thing? Yes. Um, very short because the answer is actually quite long. There are two types of template engines. There are push and pull engines. Uh, this is a push engine. You call a template and that template might also call other uh, templates and then render themselves. That, 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 that's a, a push approach. You could, solve, you could solve your problem by putting this into a specific helper and then it's behind one line of code for a designer. What I want to do here is actually show you how it works. Okay, I'm going to continue. Um, so, simply, we're taking this information, showing 20 from that, uh, from that component, and then we get something like that. There's nothing in there, so we need to make sure that there's something in there. Let's do that. Let's add a new task. Yes? Can, can we be quiet, please? Maybe the mic is not... Maybe I need to be closer to the mic? Okay, sorry. Okay, can we be quiet for our friend over here? Uh, okay, let's try this. Um, Nuku, Nuku. We save that. And we have Nuku created. And if we're lucky, then there you go. Right? He's now in his log. He now added application admin type component, package to the name task, action add, row ID 9, title Nuku, and created on and created by. So he completely locked that action. He does that for any, other, for any action. So um, let's go there and edit it. Um, Nuku improved. Save it. Well, he locked that. And then we get here. And what you see here is it's the same, the title he, he stored, because that's the way we allow, we can render what changed, and then the action is added. Does that everywhere, logging. You can add that to any of your components. Um, I need a designer still, Tom, please, I'll pay you, um, to make this dashboard look a little bit nicer, but the basics are there. No, no, you could if you want, but no. <laughs> okay, logging. That's one of the three things I wanted to show you. Take it the next step. Um, I'm going to show you where is my dashboard here. I'm going to show you that we might also want to render the latest tasks and the completed tasks, right, um, in our dashboard. Um, and that's going to, to do something like this, but there is one mistake, and that's I need to get that list here. Tasks template list, and then that will work. Enabled. Hmm. Uh, probably yes. Thank you. Thank you, Stian. Uh, can we please give Stian also more beer? No, no, cola. <laughs> okay, I'll show the error. Um, so what I'm doing is as follows. I want to show on my dashboard the latest 10 completed tasks and the latest 10 added tasks, which is very typical what you do on a dashboard. Uh, how am I doing that? I'm doing that in this way. Um, well, I make this go away so that you see the whole line of code, and I'll go through it. So the first thing that I'm doing is I'm, say, I'm saying admin come to that. This is HMVC in action. HMVC means hierarchical MVC means I have one component 
and I'm going to call another, in this case, I'm going to call the same component again, which is also possible. One component calling it again or calling another component in there. So I'm going to do admin com to that controller task. Layout is list. I want 10 items and I want them sorted by created on and the direction is descending and I display that. And the, for the second part, I want the completed task, which is admin com to dot controller task, layout is list, limit is 10, enabled is zero, and display. All right? Now, we get an error. He says, call to undefined method enabled, because I'm telling the controller to create enabled is zero, and he doesn't know what to do with that. And then Stian correctly remarks that our model that is fetching this information doesn't know about that enabled state yet, so we need to tell it about that. Because it doesn't know how to fetch that data, and we're going to do that very quick. We're going to create a model, models, tasks, and then our MVC is complete because we have created controllers, we have created views, and now we're creating the model. The model here The model here, we're going to insert a state, and we call that state enabled. It's going to be filtered as an integer, and we're going to specifically query for that state by adding a, query, a part of the work where you're saying table enabled needs to be equal to enabled. So that in our URL, and, li and also in our calls to the controller, we can use the enabled state. Now. This state we need to specifically add to our model. Any states that, there are states that are already added and those are those that are defined in your table schema as unique. For example, the ID is already added automatically as a state because it's uh, unique. The slug is also added because it's unique. Because it's very simply to query for that. It's unique so I only need to take one that I can find. All the others are a little bit more complex because you sometimes need to define how they need to be looked for in your table and then you need to write some querying yourself. Okay? To explain it a little bit. So what we now have is something that should work. What we get here is um, the latest tasks, Nuku improved and uh, Johan and uh, the completed, uh, there are no completed tasks. There's still a little bit of an error with the 41 years ago. That's because there is no uh, uh, time information in the table. Uh, yeah, that's not there. Uh, but for the last one where we added creatable, it's there, so I can get it. Um, so what I will do is I will take new task and I will, um, I need to go to tasks. I will take new task and I will disable that or complete it in this case. It's not disabled, it's completed. And then you get this and then he knows that this is completed, right? Uh, we have done that with this line of code, right? And we also written, and I haven't showed you that, we also told it to use the layout list layout, which is this layout here. And this is the one that renders this list as it's presented here. And it's not showing it in the default way. I'll show you what happens when I don't do this. Let's not tell it to use that specific layout, and then you get that. <coughs> Just to demonstrate you that this is pure MVC in action. You can get anything from anywhere, anywhere. Hmm? No. Now, reason why, I think, this, this page here, it's not, it's, not, it's not a resource controller, it's a page controller. It will not know what to do with that information uh, because it won't know how to get that, right? Um, the way we are making that work, I'll show you in a bit. Okay, so this we got, and I'll continue a little bit more. We're gonna do two more things. We're gonna add versioning and tagging. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'll copy that. So we're going to go back to our table and we're going to tell our table 
to behave nicely as taggable and as revisable. You see that here. We're going to add two behaviors, a revisable behavior and a taggable behavior. We're adding those in our list. These are two separate components. I'm not going to discuss them completely, but they provide this specific functionality. So we have done that. Then I need to double check what else I might need. Nothing in the form, the tasks form. Ah, okay, there we go. So I need to show you this. So I want to show that taggable box so that I can add tags. And I want to show you the revisions. And I'm going to show you those in the form view. So what I'm going to do, this is my form right here with our title field and our description. And I'm going to add two things to that. I'm going to say, well, if the task being rendered by this form is taggable, then show me that specific widget so that I can tag it. If it's revisable, then show me the revisions. Why is, is revisable and is taggable uh, handy? It's because suppose you're building something and you're depending on another component and the component isn't installed. And the user tries it and it completely fails because it cannot make those calls. Then you can simply check to see if that behavior is available and otherwise do nothing. Right? So we have those two and now to answer your question, what we did before we called a controller directly through code. We did okay, factory get, admin controller, get stuff. Now here, for our taggable and revisable, we're using something called an overlay. Ever worked with Zul or Mozilla? No? An, an overlay is a concept that comes from there. What we're basically doing is we are not going to call this controller through our API and through PHP. We're going to call it through HTTP and we're going to make an AJAX request to it. That's what we're doing here. We're going to say options is com terms, view is terms, row is this row, table is table task to that, and the layout is list, and then insert that. So I'll show you how that works. We go to a task, and then you get something like that. You, you saw that? Watch. Watch for the two yellow uh, rectangles loading. You see? What we're doing here is we're loading a component through an HTTP request and then we're telling it to render and we're loading that as HTML. So we're rendering it as, as HTML. And these are two little widgets. What problem does that solve? Modules. We don't do modules anymore. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It was nice, but... You can still have modules, but modules will actually simply call a component in one line of code. We built a module that is super powerful. It can call anything and anything. So just one module that you replicate, you give a few settings, and it will just load what it needs to load. We call that mod widget. Uh, anyway, revisions. Revisions, revisions, what was it? Revisions. So I want to show you how revisions work. So this, um, this row is now revisable, um, so I'm going to um, change it. And then, um, well, first of all, because there are, no, no, there. I'm going to make sure that, check all, that all this is gone. Okay. So there is no information in my revisions table. There are no dwarfs, midgets, or any other small creatures in here. And I'm going to change this. And now, fingers crossed that it all works. And there you go. You saw that? He created two revisions. Is that a bug? No, why not? Correct. He first saves the original, and then he saves the change to that original. So what we get in our table is this. This is the complete information of the original as JSON. And this is only the change. Which allows you to create, we haven't done that yet, but to create uh, provisions and then go back and, and all that. Um, OK. So the same thing, I um, haven't done that here, but the same thing happens if I would delete this. And then it's deleted. 
And then in my revisions is going to say status deleted and he has stored the complete deleted item here which allows me to restore. This is one part we haven't finished last night. It was a little bit late, but it's very easy to restore. It's actually one button added to your toolbar and just simply show all the deleted items, which is trash management everywhere and anywhere, and you just delete. And you just restore, sorry. Okay, um, now let's see, I think I'm almost there. How are we doing on time? Uh, 30 minutes. Oh, still 30 minutes. We, do, we can write a whole new uh, component. Um, okay, let's see if there's anything else in here that I wanted to show right now. Uh, the tagging, uh, we're going to show over there. Uh, I have an error on my system and I don't know why. Uh, and it's a very nasty one. I'll show you. Um, so, you see, is it, it's not liking what I'm doing. Uh, it's giving me a 400. Um, and we don't know yet why, so we're debugging that little problem. Uh, but uh, Aircon is going to show you that. Um, let's see if I still have anything else. Nope. Finally, we're going to play a little bit more, because I still have 30 minutes, with our tiny friend here. Yes. Correct. Um, done, not done that yet. So in, in this case, uh, that's good, good, good. Um, so what you do here is, if you do a new one, then it's not going to show tags and, and revisions. Uh, that's because um, what you then need to do is, then you need to uh, sync, uh, well, you need to create two requests. First, you need to save the item, and then you need to uh, save the tag. Another way of doing that uh, would be by keeping the tag and then first saving it internally and then adding the tag information to it, because you don't have an ID yet when you create a new item. So that's one of the things we haven't sold yet. Contributions, people, solutions, code, help solve it. Uh, the other few ways you could do it through Ajax and solve it by doing a, se a, se a separate request. The other problem is that the tags and the item are two separate forms. So then you would need to go look for different forms and then, and then fire those separately. So there is a, l a little bit of a challenge of doing that. But interesting problem to solve. And a good remark. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit more with our friend here to show you a tiny little bit more about, about REST uh, because that's kind of what it's all about. So I'm going to get my list. Yeah, we're not, oops, yeah, we don't want that. Oh, yeah, I, this is another cool thing I can show you. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Um, so, you know that problem where you log in into your site, edit an article, your session expires, you're logged out, and then you're nowhere but anywhere? Right? Okay. So, I go to my articles. I click on a section. This is a refactored component in Nuka Server. I'm in my section. I want to edit it, but my session expires. I'll force it. I'll log out. I need to log in. And then it takes me back to where I was. Of course, if I make changes, I will lose that unless it has been gone into a session or something like that. Don't have that yet. But it takes me to where I was. Now, where am I going when I click cancel? Where am I going? Where I started. It's a little tiny thing, but it helps a lot. Uh, it's also important um, from a REST perspective, we are not authenticating through an index.php, which is what Joomla does when you're on a level zero in your resource-oriented ar architecture. We are authenticating against any URL, which basically means if I, go, if I log out here, then this URL stays. So I'm actually logging in into this specific resource. 
I need to refactor Nuka server completely to be able to do it, but it would allow you to specifically decide that this resource needs to be logged in for, but another resource is actually viewable. What problem does that solve? Also, admin and site. You don't need to differentiate between admin and site anymore. Why do we have admin? Because we need a specific entry point to hide everything behind. If we can decide that on a controller basis, we don't need that differentiation anymore. What does that solve? Well, from an architecture perspective, a lot. And I see Hannah's going like, yes, yes. Well, maybe, but. <laughs> But it, it allows you to create web applications that don't have an administrator anymore, that are either an administrator and might have a little bit of a part that is public, and you decide that per controller. Um, so to go back on that, we have our list of tasks here. Now, I'm going to ask, and this is an other action method that you can do in a REST context, is options. You have get uh, post, now you see them here, get post, put delete, head, options, trace, and connect. Uh, there's also something called options, but options actually does it, it tells you what you can do with that resource. And there are not many frameworks that implement it. Actually, I've been spending uh, the last few weeks finding uh, literature on how to use it, and everybody is saying we don't know. But it's damn handy. So I kind of coming up with my own solution, um, which tries to stay as close as possible to the standard, but what this does is you send it, and then it goes and does something like this. It tells you that you are allowed to get, delete, post, add, apply, cancel, edit, save, and you do options. Um, so if I take a specific task, let's say ID if one, and then it will tell you you can get, put, delete, post, and if you do post requests, then specific uh, actions you can do are add, Apply, cancel, edit, save, and options. Now, watch. By default, your controller has a behavior called executable. No, sorry, editable. And the editable behavior adds uh, what I showed you, the going back and forward and the save, cancel, and apply action. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that out just to demonstrate the concept. I'm going to take this editable behavior out, and then I'm going to ask this what it can do. And then you will see that it cannot lo no longer apply, cancel, and save, like you see here. This makes, this is the start of level three, but on a header, because it makes it describable and discoverable. It tells something about this resource and what it can do. I could do another cool thing with that, uh, ACL. Um, so let's take this back. Now let's, let's not allow edits. This is the basic ACL implement. We do have an ACL, and it works with 1.5 and 1.6 on any resource. Um, so let's not allow edits. And then ask this resource what it can do. And then it will say, well, you can get, put, delete, and post, and, but you cannot edit because the edit is not here anymore. Right? So what will happen is, and let me log back in. No, that's the wrong site. Yeah, and then I need to get out, of course, which is going to be very hard. Nope. Okay. Um, is that also an edit? Probably. No, it isn't. Um, come to the fewest tasks. Step up. Uh, test. Let's see if that works. Save. See? You get an action not allowed. That's ACL. But it's not only ACL on an API level, on a PHP level, it's ACL on a resource level. If I try to do this, if I try to do a post on this resource and I try to change it, title is Robert, and I try to do that, let's, fingers crossed, 
everything okay? Yep. Then it's going to tell me method not allowed. You cannot do that. That's not only ACL in your API, it's ACL on resource level. So anybody else that comes in and goes like, I can log in and I think I can edit this, cannot. And then the cool thing is, we have a default executable behavior that does that. So we have an executable behavior that has a before add, a before edit, and a before delete because it, this is where the ACL is implemented. Per component, and actually per controller, you can specialize this. So you can decide for your resource, for your controller, how it behaves ACL-wise. Well, I'm actually blocking the, the edit uh, on a breadth uh, level. So what, I, what is very important is that we always go back to the five actions. We always go back to browse, read, edit, add of the lead. What safe actually does is, and I'll show you the code for safe. Uh, what safe actually does is, and where is it? There is it. Um, safe is going to make a decision if the action is added or the action is add. And it's going to make that decision based on the model state. And the model state is either unique or not unique. When is your model state unique? When you have an ID, when it's unique, when you're looking at a single resource, it's unique. When it's unique, and when you're not looking at a collection, when you're looking at a unique, then it's, uh, it's going to be added, otherwise it's going to be added. That's the difference. So very important in this context and in this breadth context, controller context, is that you always go back to those five actions because then it makes ACL very easy. I'm just doing ACL on edit, which is again a good remark. Okay. Um, I'll do five minutes questions and in the meantime, Erkan is going to set up, then we can hopefully show taggable. And then we have prepared something very special um, where we have been hacking on for the last two days. We have done a webhooks integration. What is a webhook? I'll let you, you can set up and connect. Uh, what, is, what is a, take the laptop. What, what is a, what is a webhook? Who, whoever developed for PayPal? Uh, yeah, get a webhooks, yes. Yeah, exactly. So if you worked with PayPal, you have IPNs, uh, instant payment notifications, which is basically you give it a URL and then it calls that URL, right? We've done something like that, and then fingers crossed that it works. We've done something like that on, on, on a REST level. There's actually a website, webhooks.org, where you can go to and read about webhooks. It's a very simple con uh, concept. It's a URL that you let a web application call. And we're doing it in such a way that you can register that URL with a site through REST. And then it will call that URL for any action that happens on that resource that you registered it for. And we're going to show you how we do use that to sync two sites. Now what problem does that solve? It solves redundancy and import and export. Because, for example, if, if you want to keep two sites in sync, or if you want to keep the users of two sites in sync, and the one site is in Australia and the other is in the UK, and they're running on two separate servers, you cannot really do that. With this, you can. And the only thing you need to do is you need to make one call to that one site and say, hey, for any user that is added, added or deleted, I want to get notified. The implementation is very basic and very rough. It's a proof of concept. Um, what we're trying to do with this is move into a direction where, and this is also what Google is experimenting with, we let the web evolve into a push context. Because web is pull. We constantly are pulling resources to see if they have changed. Uh, RSS feeds are a great example of pull. All, you're all the time looking at that URL of that feed to see if it changed, and when it's changed, you update. Uh, it would be great if that resource could basically tell you, hey, I just changed myself, uh, go get me. And you turn the internet around. You go from pull, uh, from pull to push. And that's a concept that we're playing with. So let's hope that it works. So um, maybe we need to, yeah, you cannot show that, right? No, okay, it's okay. You can? I can 
Control CS. Oh yeah, let's do that. So there are bugs that don't work. And this is not a Windows versus uh, Linux uh, mic thing, but there are a few bugs of mine. The CSV export. So what I have been, probably because during the conference I, I tend to hack when I'm in sessions and then I start making changes and then that are not committed and not properly tested. So this is why sometimes my code fails <laughs> while the rest still works. And Dave knows what then happens when I start committing that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So when you click export, it's going to create an export, and this is just a CSV export of all the data that is in there. Happens automatically, you get the file, and the file is named after the resource, and you can just put that into Excel or, or anything else. Okay, um, then let's see if we can get the webhooks going. So, uh, explain a little bit. We have, uh, okay, normally we would have one side in Australia on the left and one side in the US on the right. Uh, unfortunately, we're not on the internet and we, we we're not sure that the internet will work properly. Uh, so we made it a little bit more complex. Uh, this is actually the same physical installation. Uh, this is a Nuku server running in a multi-site and on the right we're logging in in the test site and on the left we're logging in, in the default site. Right, and we're going to make those two connect over HTTP. Still following? Not falling asleep there? Okay. So we're adding a new one in the default. There you go. And this is done. Thank you. Uh, th th this is a long while I got that. The first time I actually, uh, it's a deja vu. The first time I got that was when I showed the user interface of 1.5 in the installer on the first Joomla day in the Netherlands. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> It's really true. It's really fun. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, it, it works on add at the moment, and the rest is still delete also. Let's try delete. Delete and delete. You see? So that's what we're working on. And, and this is what I, what, I, what I was telling at the beginning, an operating system for the web. These are the basic blocks, the, the, the tiny seeds that are being set to come to that point where we're going to use the web as an application platform and we're going to make components and applications talk to each other over HTTP using uh, resource-oriented architecture. And then we'll see what innovative things happen on top of that. I don't know, but this is already a lot of fun to build those. Dave? No. Um, can you show that? In the, in, in the database? So because uh, it, we support uh, uh, basic out, you can just the URL you define, in this case, the callback URL is admin admin, which is the username and the password, and then the URL for that site. If you actually do the complete URL, then you will see that that site defines, that the URL defines against which site it needs to uh, call the webhook. This is the webhook, and then the webhook information also contains the site information. If you scroll down, you will see index PHP, comptadav, US tasks, and site is test. So you're telling it actually to go to the test site, into the doc component, in that resource view, and add it there. What are we going to add to that? Uh, we're actually going to add to that that you can specifically define for your hook on what action it needs to, uh, to be called. So if you want to browse, read, edit, add, delete, of course, browse and read. Not really ideal for performance, but you, technically you could. And then we're also going to add support for content types so that you can tell it what content type it needs to get back, a JSON uh, or in any, any other format. And then you have a proper webhook integration, uh, which is very cool to play with. Um, of course, if you want to do that in an enterprise context where you want to use principles like this, you need something like, what's it called? Pub, hub, sub, pub. 
yeah, something like that. Um, it's a protocol divide created by some of the Google guys, and what it basically it does this. It's web it's webhook based, but it puts a, a specific messaging server in between. So this installation would actually call the messaging server, and then the messaging server would would retrieve uh, the the requests for notifications and send out the calls to all those URLs because otherwise you're going to get your server performance down if everybody starts receiving requests directly from your server. But for very simple things like syncing on delete or syncing on edit, it's not really a problem unless a hundred people, a hundred different sites are going to be interested in knowing that. Anything else? Yeah, text, please. So that doesn't that doesn't work on mine, and it should work here. There you go. So nuco comma framework, and then it adds nuco and framework, and you can delete the tags. And what you can then do is, uh, then you can uh, search. Um, I'm not sure. And then you can search all the all all the all the the tasks for that specific tag. We haven't done that yet, um, but that's the idea. So you can now define the tags, and it knows that those tags were for that specific item. You can list all of them in the, in the tag cloud, um, or start browsing for that specific tag. Okay. Any more questions? Hannes. How far are you with your uh, REST implementation from the, uh, for, for options from the uh, spec? Well, uh, well uh, so I'll show you the, I don't have the books with me, but it's like this pile. Um, Again, we, we don't try to reinvent, uh, the, we have some philosophies, we don't like to try, try to reinvent the wheel, there's already a wheel and we want to try to make it roll smoother, so you need to study the, the literature, I have like books that high. I'm halfway through it. Um, the thing is that they all say something a little bit different, so then it becomes like trying to figure out what they're actually trying to say. I'm now in, in the process of actually reading the mailing list where Roy Fielding actually is on uh, to, to see specific questions that I have and how he, he answers those questions uh, to understand how he actually envisioned it and, and created it so that I know how it all works. There are a few challenges like with the options, nobody really knows how options work. Uh, so what I did is I followed the spec and then I added the brackets and then the post information to it, which is a little bit that I added, but yeah, because it's very handy to have that information and it's still following the spec in a way. Um, we are there, uh, there is a little bit of using uh, um, rec uh, response codes and which response codes to use where. Uh, there's a few points where I'm not really 100% sure, but the rest is there. Uh, going to level three, uh, that's a whole different ball game, because then we need to start adding uh, and understanding relations between resources, which also needs to happen in the architecture, and then you need to expose that through something like Atom or any other uh, uh, format. You could start playing with RDF in your HTML, or you could start playing with RDF uh, to create triplets and that kind of stuff, which is all different different way of doing it. But the level two, I'm, like, I think the level two is like 90% there with what I showed today. Uh, the only missing part, and we're going to talk about that after this session, is URL templating, uh, AK routing, AK SEO, which is not necessarily the same, but or Ceph. Uh, but that part isn't there. But technically, it doesn't matter because the URLs are either unique or either un not unique, and they're always go to uniquely to a resource. Does that answer it? Okay. So Nuku framework doesn't try to uh, force anything upon you. Um, we, 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 there's, there are things we don't implement, like sessions. The sessions are handled by the application itself, which is where we're interfacing with. Uh, the ACL is, ha is handled by the application itself, where we're interfacing with. That doesn't mean that in time we will not be building our own ACL solutions, and Dave already did that. But ACL is one of those things that is very application specific. Uh, it is very hard to develop one ACL that fits all. Um, so it, it, it's much better that you have an architecture where you can fit that ACL into, and that's what we're trying to do first. And then we will see what the basic ACL can be that people can extend upon uh, to solve. But we already, like I showed, interface with the 1.6 ACL on a basic level, and you can easily specialize on top of that by doing a few overrides. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, no, well, th th what I showed you is uh, we call that an identifier. It's actually called an identifiable pattern. Yes. Um, no, that's a convention. Uh, you could start changing that um, very easily, but then you need to write an, an autoloader that takes uh, that takes care of that. And I'm looking at Oleg. You have done that, right? No? D didn't you write a factory adapter, a specific factory adapter for the CouchDB integration? Yeah. Yes. So you can. T what? The yeah, the loader and the factory. So, can you actually can you go to the code? And then just show okay, factory and loader. So there are two ways. You have the factory, and the factory is going to create the object based on the class name. And then you have the loader that is actually going to look for the file. You can write your own loader and factory adapters. And Oleg has done that to create a CouchDB integration that sits in a separate uh, library folder. So all that, again, is very extendable. Like I said, I only have two hours, well, an hour and a half to show you a little bit what this can do. Um, there is much, much, much more under the hood that um, that you can do uh, with. And I haven't even touched on how the command chains work. I haven't even touched on the mix-ins that are in there or the, all the design patterns that we use. Uh, there is some pretty nasty power in there, isn't there? <laughs> So this is the factory, um, and if you go to um, actually go to the the um, yeah and uh, go to the uh, framework or the, the framework in the includes to the framework .php file. I mean, this is a Nuka server, right? And in the includes, and then the framework, yeah, there, and then down, 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 down. So what you see here is kloader add adapter, a coa uh, adapter, a Joomla adapter, a module adapter, a plugin adapter, and a component adapter, and for the factory, the same thing. Uh, those are responsible for knowing where to load the module, where to load the plugin, where to load the component, and how to create those. If you want to do that in your own way in, and have your own library with your own conventions, then you just write separate loaders. You could write loaders for other frameworks, too. For example, you could write a loader for Zend or a, a factory for Zend, and then easily use kfactory to get Zent in or get uh, another framework in. Yes? Um, so data validation is done, first of all, uh, based on the, the, the value, the, the type of the, of the field in your database. Uh, there are, of course, fields and types that, that don't exist in your database. And then you need to either do that with the annotation that I showed you. You could do add, filter, and then uh, the specific filter. Or you could do that in your overrided uh, table model, uh, in your overrided table class, sorry. You could specify the filter for that field. And uh, if you look at the filter package, Yeah, okay, filter, and then just show the folder, maybe, so that I can see all the filters in the, the, in the, in the libraries. Um, so we have, this is the filter package, uh, which is kfilter, and you have a whole list of filters that we have already created. And you can very easily create your own filter, and then put that in your own component. And if you have created a filter in your own component, somebody else could even decide to use that. So this is the way the filtering works. But the, the lowest level of filtering is always the field in your database. Uh, this is what we do if we don't find anything else. But any data that comes in is filtered uh, for cross-site scripting. And it's also escaped for output. Uh, this is the, the a security layer that is automatically there. It should help. I, I hope that it helps, but it should help to make sure that the components that are built are a lot more secure. Also, tokens are automatically added to forms to uh, prevent cross-site scripting uh, request forgeries. Uh, that's done through a template filter. If the template filter finds a form, it will automatically add a token to it. And you need to specifically turn it off to not get it. So this is kind of like how we try to prevent developers that are not security experts and developers shouldn't be security experts that's you cannot be everything but I try to prevent you from making mistakes that you don't know about yet any more other questions yes 
Well, so what we're going to do with Nuku content is we're going to make it a reusable component that is going to offer translations um, as for everybody. So we're going to build Nuku content as a probably as some sort of comp translations and then make it available so that everybody can use that. Um, that's something that we still need to work on. We're working with the Belgian police and part of that project is to move them completely to Nuku server and then implement uh, translations. The problem that we have with Nuku content is that it is very, very hard to do translations uh, for Joomla 1.5 and 1.6 with all these components out there uh, because there's simply not enough architecture available to rely on and everybody is doing things in his own way and you constantly get conflicts with other extensions. Uh, this architecture is built to solve that. So the decision for content and translations is that we're going to build a translation and a multilingual solution but only for Nuku components and only through Nuku server. Or, well, if the component is installed in 1.5 it will only work for Nuku components. It will not work work for other Joomla components. Um, well, you're not forced to use Nuku Server. You, you will then be able to install it in your Joomla site, but it will not be able to install any, uh, translate any other co extensions or components besides Nuku components. So you're not forced to go anywhere, but you cannot start translating anything that is not Nuku based with that. The one, the one that we have today will be continued and supported for the existing partners that we already have, if that's another question. But only in 1.5. Yeah. Well, we're, the, the simple thing is we're, we're with 1.6 uh, support ending in like a few weeks, and then 1.7 already coming. It's, it's simply there's way too much uncertainty on wh where things are going. Plus, the most, most of the extensions that we then need to add specific support for or not even on 1.6 yet, so it's all a little bit in, 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 in limbo there. Uh, there w the development that will be is that it will become a reusable component for, for, uh, for, for Nuku and for Nuku server and uh, it won't be developed as a specific component for 1.6, 1.7. Yeah, the, the the thing is, we there are we try to solve a lot of problems by making the framework as um, as solid as possible and as easily as possible to inject it in other web applications. Like for example, you can use it in WordPress. We have tested that with Stian, uh, but there are simply problems you cannot solve uh, if the other developers are not using your framework and your architecture. That that it's the way it is. If that was the case, then then the world's problems would probably be solved tomorrow. So. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's the, the the correct way of saying it. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, probably we still need to look at that. Um, we, we, I'm not sure if it ever will be like it. it we were working on an installer. There is an installer that's that's the road that uh, allows you to install the framework and an extension. That's something that we're working on. But will there ever be a download button on the website? Probably not. Um, that the that gets us user questions. Uh, and not developer questions. Uh, the the response no, serious. The, the responsibility uh, lies then with you as uh, as the integrator, uh, creating the product for the customer that is then going to install their auto update it or whatever your model is going to be there. That doesn't mean that we're not interested in developing an installer that everybody can use. And and there's where's Nicholas? Is he here? Nicholas is not here. Nicholas has uh, made an, a proposal for an auto updater. How can we create a, a solution that you can auto update extensions? Um, but Will there ever be a download button? Probably not. Uh, we, what we did already is we have a pre-packaged Nuku server with Nuku framework and everything on Git. So if you do a Git pull, you have everything that is already updated. So yeah, just like a little bit of decision there, but probably everything will move to Git and it will simply become a pull uh, solution for installing uh, everything. And then if you need a specific installer, that's a separate problem. More questions? Well, yes. 
uh, the partners that we have currently, they basically are getting a framework, they're getting an application server, uh, and they still have Nuku content that they can use on 1.5, which is what we delivered them. Um, the, the step to 1.6 is not a step that we're making because we cannot solve the problems that people are asking us to solve there. We need a different architecture to do that, and that is what Nuku Framework and Nuku Server are all about. Yeah? It's 6 o'clock. Well, then we wrap up. Uh, thank you for your interest. If there are any more questions, we're at the booth over there, and we're happy to answer those.